Welcome to The Spine Guy. I'm Dr. Brian Sue, a fellowship trained spine surgeon in Marin, California. The Spine Guy is a channel dedicated to making the complex spine simple for patients to understand. I previously did a video on myelopathy, spinal cord compression, and when you may or may not need surgery. Well, this video is a brief overview on the different types of surgery we do for patients who have myelopathy as well as spinal cord compression. As a reminder, this is the back of the neck. We call that posterior. This is the front of the neck. We call that anterior. The spinal cord is what is kind of behind these lamina or bones and this is the yellow thing. When people have cord compression, this yellow thing in the middle is compressed. There's really only one goal when you're treating myelopathy and cord compression. It's to take pressure off of the cord so that the cord has room to breathe again. Now this can be done either from the front, which are called anterior approaches, or from the back, which are called posterior approaches. I perform all these surgeries and sometimes we'll do this from the front and sometimes we'll do this from the back or sometimes we'll do what's called a front-back combined approach. So anterior surgeries are done from the front and they usually involve taking the disc out. So you go from the front to the back, take the disc out and take the pressure off of the spinal cord. The two general anterior procedures we perform is something called an ACDF or anterior cervical decompression and fusion. I actually have a really good video on that. Um, it's for a different type of problem, but the actual surgery is the same and the link is below. Um, and the next is called a cervical disc replacement or CDR. Again, and there's a link below uh, for a video uh, specifically on CDR. When we do an ACDF or CDR, the uh, surgery is usually done from the front of the neck. We basically make a small incision and then the front of the neck, which is here, is very, very close um, to the skin. That approach is very fast. It's usually a three to five minute approach to get from the skin to the front of the cervical spine. It's a very, very elegant approach. So once we're down to the front of the cervical spine, we basically take the disc out. And in the case of an anterior cervical decompression infusion, in place of that disc, we'll usually put a, a little cage with a plate and screws to stabilize it. Again, you'll see this on the other video. In the case of a cervical disc replacement, we'll put an actual mobile bearing device so that you can still have motion at that segment. Again, you'll have to talk to your surgeon about what's right for you, whether it be an anterior cervical fusion or a disc replacement. One advantage of doing a cervical fusion is because there's a plate and because there are implants, you can actually correct any kind of abnormal deformity. So this is one of my patients who has cord compression. You can see they have what's called kyphosis. Kyphosis is when the neck pitches forward like that. And that's, that's abnormal anatomy and sometimes a spinal cord can then drape abnormally um, over some of these bone spurs. So in this situation, we went to the front and by taking out the discs and putting in cages, we can slowly build that kind of curve back. So this is a four level surgery, but you can see that um, the pressure is taken off of the spinal cord as a plate and screws to hold everything in place as it fuses. Here's another patient who's 40 years old, pretty normal looking neck other than some big discs that are pushing on the spinal cord. So in this situation, we did a cervical disc replacement. We went in, took the disc out, took the pressure off the spinal cord. And this is what's called a flexion extension x-ray. That's the x-ray taken while flexing forward, chin down. Extension is the x-ray taken with chin up. And you'll see that there is some motion maintained at those segments, uh, which is why a disc replacement sometimes is a nice approach for myelopathy. Um, there are basically two different approaches uh, from the back of the cervical spine. Um, I should mention that uh, traditionally, many, many years ago, some surgeons were doing what's called a laminectomy, and we can do that for the lumbar spine, but it turns out you cannot do it for the cervical spine. So a laminectomy basically involves, if you see these pen lines, cutting here, cutting here, and then removing this whole middle segment to unroof the spinal cord underneath it. A laminectomy by itself, we found that over time, patients develop what's called post-laminectomy kyphosis, which is basically your head keeps dropping and dropping because you don't have support back here. So in general, a laminectomy alone for treatment of spinal cord compression is rarely ever done these days, except for very, very unique situations. There are two uh, really nice kind of posterior approaches uh, that are both reasonable for treatment of myelopathy. One's called a laminoplasty. A laminoplasty is one of my favorite operations. And then one's called a laminectomy infusion. And in my mind, um, there's a place for both of these. I tend to gravitate towards a laminoplasty because it's motion preserving uh, instead of a laminectomy infusion, which is not motion preserving. And I think it's just much bigger surgery uh, with some kind of bigger downstream consequences. Um, in general, I'll try to perform a laminoplasty whenever it's possible, but both are really good surgical treatments. And again, you'll have to talk to your surgeon about that. 
So for a laminoplasty, it's kind of like an angioplasty for the clogged artery in the heart. They put a balloon and they kind of stent it open. So plasty just means to expand. So basically what a laminoplasty is, is making a cut on one side all the way through the bone and then making a cut on the other side partially through the bone. So if you cut all the way on one side and cut partially on the other side, you can kind of hinge it open like a trap door. So I've tried to try to show it here. So here's a cross section like that. So your spinal cord is actually running through here. And we've cut all the way through on one side, cut partially through on the other. And as a result, you're able to hinge it open like that. So the open side is here, the closed side is here, and it's basically like a little trap door. And you can see as a result of the trap door, the canal diameter opens and the spinal cord has space. Well, we used to kind of hold this little trap door open with use of sutures, but now we hold the trap door open um, with plates and screws. So here's a picture of a laminoplasty. And you'll see that each individual segment has an opening here, is trap door opened, and has a little kind of plate that holds it open and these little baby mini screws that go in that kind of keep it open. So there you'll see the space for the canal that's now much wider because a plate is stenting it open. The nice thing about this is every vertebral segment is still independent and can still move independently. So you can still have motion in flexion and extension because you've not connected these kind of vertebral segments. You've basically stented each one open. So that's called a cervical laminoplasty. And a cervical plasty actually preserves about 90% of the native motion that somebody has. So it's a very, very nice way of treating myelopathy. So here you see some of the, I did a laminoplasty and you can see them flexion and extension. You can kind of see how each individual segment is stented open with these little metal plates, but the patient still has um, pretty good motion. The next surgery that's all done from the back is called a posterior laminectomy infusion. So laminectomy means we basically go in and again, we do make these two troughs, but we remove the entire lamina so the spinal cord is exposed. As I said before, we found that if you do a laminectomy, you get post-laminectomy kyphosis or instability. So once the laminectomy is done, what we have to do is we have to put little screws into the bone here and connect the screws with a rod to keep it rigid so that it prevents the neck from falling forward. So that's the fusion portion. And we do put bone graft in the back here to allow everything to fuse. So here's a, a good example of a laminectomy infusion. So this is just to orient you. This is the back of the skull. So if you were to look at me like this, it would kind of look like that. So here's the back, here's the front. But this is the back of the skull and Normally this would be gone because of the laminectomy, but this kind of is a good look at the hardware. So the screws will go into the bone. They'll then be connected by a rod and there's these little tulip head things that connect them and the rod just holds it in place and there's bone graft on the side to help it grow. So that's the laminectomy infusion. I will use that procedure sometimes because if patients already have deformity coming in or they already have a ton of arthritis, um, Sometimes fusing them really isn't gonna to lead to that much loss of motion, and so there is a need to fuse somebody. Again, for me, there has to be a really good reason to a laminectomy fusion, and there are good reasons to perform it. Otherwise, I'm usually performing a laminoplasty. Sometimes there's such bad deformity in the neck, as well as spinal cord compression, that we have to do what's called a combined anterior and posterior fusion. Well, all that really means is we go to the front first, take out the discs, we may or may not put a plate. Usually we'll put bone grafts or cages here, to structurally reconstruct the neck because the anatomy is abnormal, whether or not a patient's really pitched forward, et cetera. And then the back, after the front, then we'll put in these kind of screws and rods. So here's one of the patients, he's 69, he's a photographer. He had kind of just congenitally fused spine um, as well as a pitched forward posture. And here you can see he had pretty severe cord compression. So we went to the front, we took out the discs. You can see there are little um, bony cages there with a the plate and screws. And in the back, 
we reconstructed his neck so he could be, you know, propped upright and his spinal cord was safe. Um, so that's a that's an anterior posterior surgery. Here's another patient we did recently who had a chin on chest deformity. So here you can see his x-ray and the neck is completely pitched forward like that. Um, and in the bed, this is kind of what he initially looked like. He came to me with kind of what's called drop head syndrome. Um, and we did this in a couple of different stages. The first stage is uh, again, anteriorly. So we went to the front, took out um, multiple discs, reconstructed his neck with cages, put a plate on to try to hold it up and then went to the back um, and then put in screws to kind of lock everything in place. So these combined surgeries are complex cases. Um, definitely I would recommend uh, asking a surgeon if they routinely perform kind of combined anterior posterior surgeries, et cetera, for myelopathy. There are patients that come to my office that are definitely candidates and really should be having a surgery from the front, like an anterior cervical fusion that's also called a ventrally based procedure, or patients that really should be having a surgery from the back, like either a laminoplasty or a posterior cervical fusion, which is called a dorsal or posterior based procedure. Then there's that third group of patients, which is really quite common, which is really you could go either from the front or from the back, and it's kind of dealer's choice. For many years, it's been hotly debated amongst the spine surgery community of whether or not patients should be having surgery from the front or surgery from the back. One of the best clinical trials to come out about this was in 2021 published in JAMA, which is the Journal of American Medical Association. This is one of the highest impact journals that we have, and spine surgery studies, by the way, almost never make it into JAMA. Essentially, this paper took 160 some on patients and randomized them into either surgery from the front or from the back, assuming that they were candidates for both. 24 surgeons participate in the study across all of North America. At the two-year time point, this clinical trial study showed that those patients that had surgery from the front essentially did the same from an outcome standpoint as those patients that had surgery from the back. For that reason, really you should talk to your surgeon about whether or not they're more comfortable doing surgery from the front or from the back, but both will lead to very similar outcomes. I think one of the most interesting things about this study is when they did the subgroup analysis comparing the three different surgeries, anterior cervical fusion, posterior cervical laminectomy infusion, and posterior cervical laminoplasty, the laminoplasty procedure was better than both the cervical fusion from the back or from the front from an outcomes and complications standpoint. For that reason, if I have a patient that's a candidate for all those three, and there are many patients who are candidate for all three, I'm always gonna choose a laminoplasty because I think those clinical outcomes are better. I also think it preserves motion in the neck. You'll have to watch my laminoplasty video to understand the risks and benefits of a laminoplasty. But there you have kind of a quick rundown of different ways to treat spinal cord compression. Again, anteriorly, ACDF, anterior cervical fusion, CDR, cervical disc replacement. Posteriorly, we do not usually recommend a laminectomy alone because it causes post-laminectomy, what's called a kyphosis. So, um, either a laminoplasty, where you make a trough on one side, you trap door open, you hold it open with little plates, or you do a laminectomy, taking the pressure off the cord from the back, and a fusion with um, screws and rods to hold it up. So those, those are kind of the two posterior ways to do it. Both are acceptable, and it turns out there's been lots of research in our literature about which one's better from the front, from the back. It actually turns out that the better one is what your surgeon's most comfortable with, most familiar with, which kind of makes sense. Again, as I said in my other video, the surgical treatment for myelopathy is really to stabilize the condition, not necessarily make it better. Although um, some patients who have very kind of mild myelopathy or patients who are younger, less than 65, tend to get some recovery from it. At the end of the day, when there is cord compression and you're symptomatic, there's myelopathy, um, surgery is very much indicated and there's lots of different ways to treat it. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the subscribe and like button below. You can certainly leave comments um, in the comment box below and feel free to let me know what videos you would like to watch in the future.